a certain modality of sex, uh, size exclusion chromatography in line with sex has become the go-to method now at synchrotron beam line, right? And now there are vendors that are trying to implement the same experiment on home sources with newer generation instruments. So what we're gonna do here, so the talk is kind of comes in two parts. Uh, what we're gonna do is first talk about the sex related uh, applications. Uh, review the principles of sex. Talk about sex malls, probably a more familiar application if you're in biochemistry or structural biology lab. And then talk about sex sex, right? So hopefully along the line, you'll see a logical linkage between all of them in terms of application um, and the types of information and the things you can learn. And then we're gonna change gears and talk about one of the most popular things to do when you get this data in hand is the ab initio shape reconstruction in broad strokes. Right? So let's first talk and just review the principles of size seclusion chromatography. It has a lot of different uh, pseudonyms, um, but we'll just call it SEC for right now. All right. So in this approach, you have a column right, of a certain length and diameter that is filled with a matrix of media all right, that is comprised of these very fine beads on the micron scale. Um, and the purpose of this, of this packed material is to help you separate macromolecules from one another. All right? In its approach here at time point zero, you might have your load reflect at the top of the column, and then it's isocratically uh, drawn through the column using buffer. And during the course of that experiment, as it isocratically moves along, small things are retained longer than larger things. Right, and that's because the large things are large enough where they don't really get stuck and retended and uh, caught up in the nooks and crannies of that matrix that's in there in the column back together, right? Whereas the small things will go in and kind of stick along the surface and the nooks and crannies and get retained and not elute, and it will elute at a much later um, time point. So allowing you to resolve different species from initial starting mixture. This is a very common place application. This is the, uh, we'll discuss in a moment, the most basic and simplest biophysical experiment you can carry out in the lab. All right. The general setup of this experiment is generally commonplace. All right. um, you start with some buffer reservoir solution. All right. If you're talking about light scattering and small scattering, there's most certainly an advantage to making sure those buffers are filtered. All right. So generally speaking, for solution biophysics, you want to be probably filtered at least 0.2 micron or finer in light scattering, SACS, AUC, all right, um, and degassed, right? Because uh, buffers will degas if they change in temperature or, you know, if it's a change in pressure, uh, and those gas bubbles will scatter, air scatters, okay? And so we start with the buffer reservoirs, right? We have a pump system that pumps the solutions through. We have an inline and injection valve that allows us to introduce a sample into the experiment, right? So then our column, our mode of separation, right? These come in many different varieties uh, for the applications we're talking about. We're most frequently using analytical size columns. If you're buying GE healthcare columns, you use the 26 mil variety or the three mil variety. It's ultimately to use columns that are larger it's probably in concept possible to use smaller columns, um, whether they be silica or the agarose acrylamide mixture, right? Your sample then would be uh, would be carried through the column, retended or uh, retained in some amount, and then brought through and detected using a UV vis spectrophotometer, right? So protein has an absorbance of 280 nanometers. You'll see a peak come up if your sample's coming through. A lot of gel filtration systems have conductivity meters if you're doing two pump applications with, for example, uh, ion strain chromatography and their, or a pH meter, right? For most applications we're talking about, we're not gonna worry about these things here, but we will have a detector like the UV this in line to help us see when the solute is coming through. And then most commonly, you have a fraction collector where you collect fractions. All right, so as I mentioned, this is gonna be the simplest biophysical experiment you can do because you can then basically characterize samples that are not retained well, the large things, and resolve them from the smaller things, right? If you're using a UV spectrophotometer or if you're using a uh, refractive, uh, differential refractive um, interferometer, the area under the curve is going to be proportional to the mass 
of that material. So you also have a relative readout, there are all proportions of these species in the sample. Okay. Um, and generally, you can normalize this data regardless of the size of the column and the flow rate relative to the void volume, that is the volume um, encompassing the first total volume of the total column, and then the total uh, the void volume, and then the total column volume, that is um, where everything gets diluted off, including the volume of the beads, right? So low molecular weight things like vitamin B12 or a small dye will come out at the very, very end, knowing that you're at the end of your run, all right? The aggregates will come out here, near the void. Buffer artifacts and the really small things, a difference in the chemical composition, come out here near the total column volume. Okay. The most common application and misperception about gel filtration is you can determine, use it to determine molecular mass of a macromolecule. And to some extent, it's true. Here is a gel filtration standard run. You have seven different globular proteins, keyword being globular, ranging in size from 10 to 600 kilodaltons. And you can see that if you plot the log of their mass versus their elution volume, you can get derive a very nice and tidy relationship. All right. This holds reasonably well for globular macromolecules that are isotropic in shape. If you look at the crystal structures of these things, they all look like you know bowling balls of different varieties. Right? These rules, though, start falling apart when you have anisotropic shapes, things that are elongated, right? And things that are unfolded or partially folded or globule in um, fold. And so there's a fellow named uh, Uversky from the University of Indiana um, who has written extensive literature on intrinsically disordered proteins and the application of gel filtration to study their properties and identify them just from gel filtration. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So to some extent, you can derive or infer molecular mass, but that's not what you're measuring in this experiment. What you're actually measuring is the hydrodynamic radius of the macromolecule, all right? Uh, because it's basically the radius of a hard sphere as it migrates through um, a medium, all right? And so here's a, a nice old paper uh, that very nicely catalogs the Stokes radii for a series of standard proteins that are still used today for gel filtration application. And then using these figures, you can derive uh, well, this is the wrong one, sorry. Well, you can use these and plot a standard curve and derive pretty well the Stokes radius of a macromolecule in a gel filtration run. Right. Really, that's the most accurate piece of information you're getting from that experiment. The inference of mass is just that, an inference. Okay. Um, now, when you're not dealing with proteins, some of this falls apart. Good example of this is double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA. All right, where the mass of the different size DNA particles does not exactly correlate to that of protein standard. And the reason is you have rod-shaped particles that have very large hydrodynamic radii, even though they have high molecular weight, they're actually much smaller. And so uh, another common phenomenon in gel filtration is that you might have a protein DNA complex. You run the linear DNA, you get a retention time. You run the protein DNA complex, and oddly, you get the same retention time, right? even though you know the protein's bound. And that's because the largest radii of that particle is being defined by the larger, the longer component, the DNA. Right? And so there's a very common um, confusion that occurs when you're studying protein DNA complexes if your DNA is much longer than the longest dimensions of the protein component. Okay? And so be aware, I mean, the point is be aware that when you're working with nucleic acids, you can't directly compare them necessarily to their molecular weight standards. But the Stokes radii will be accurate. Any questions about gel filtration and that basic implementation? It's the simplest biophysical experiment we can do, but there are downsides. Um, and you can illustrate those downsides by looking at sec mol states. All right, so sec mol is size and solution chromatography in line with multi-angle light scattering. Call tech ball because it's a lot shorter. And the experiment's very similar in design. This part here on the left is what we just reviewed basically a basic gel filtration setup where you have a 
sample reservoir, hopefully an inline degasser, right? You have a pump, right? Pumping solvent through a gel filtration column of some variety, right? And then into a UV detector. Where the experiment then starts becoming different are the downstream components. Here we're showing you two components. Here in the top is a multi-angle light scattering instrument. Here in the bottom is a differential refractometer. If you were to open the hood of the dynamic light scattering instrument from Y Technologies, what you would see inside is a cubit of a very peculiar geometry. It looks like a hockey puck, a big quartz hockey puck, right? Solvent is brought through down the core of that hockey puck, and then a laser is then scattering that pollution material, that, that illuent, right, in one second increments, and then collecting light scattering data at between three to 18 different angles. And then every second it's collecting new data. Right? So all it does is accumulate a ton of data every second. And then we'll explain why that in a second. That illuminant comes out from that box and then goes into the differential refractometer. Right? The DNDC of protein, regardless of sequence, is always 0.185, uh, I forget the units, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's cubic grams per centimeter mass, double check that. But, you can relate that differential refractive index of protein, the DNDC, to an absolute protein concentration. This is our concentration defender uh, detector and much more reliable than UV optics and its theoretical, theoretical expansion coefficients. So now, in each one second time slide, you have eight, upwards of 18 angles of light scattering. Sometimes you have inline dynamic light scattering. And you have a concentration readout right, along that gel filtration trace. What can you do with it? All right. So in the classic light scattering experiment, you can take that information, the concentration, and the angular dependent light scattering, and actually calculate molecular weight average molecular mass. Okay, uh, and this calculation is now done on the fly every second. All right, uh, it's collecting all of this 19, 20 channels of data. Okay, and calculating this mass here. Now remember, we talked about how things like aggregates and polydispersity can affect that mass calculation when you have mixtures, okay? Because large things scatter very strongly, all right? Um, and so this is where leveraging the size exclusion in line with multi-angle light scattering is extremely advantageous, right? So this is one, this is BSA run on a gel filtration column. I believe it's SuperDex 200, all right? I'm showing you different channels of data here. In green is the UV optics. In blue is a differential refractive index. And in red is one of 18 channels of light scattering data. If I wanted to, I could turn on all the channels and just do this big rainbow here. Uh, but we'll simplify. When you run BSA in biological buffers on a gel filtration column, it samples a monomer, dimer, trimer equilibrium in solution. Sometimes it's easier to resolve than others, depending on how well packed your column is. Right, how well you take care of it. Here I've, lo I've loaded a large amount, because my goal here is to get this monomer peak and to get some very strong scattering from that. I just take one second time point here at the peak and look at this zim divide plot, okay? Here are the 18 channels of light scattering information, right, plotted using that equation from the previous page, right, function of scattering angle here. And the y-intercept is directly proportional to molecular mass. Right, so at each one second time point, I'm getting the y-intercept on this plot of measure molecular mass that I can then correlate to a peak position on this gel filtration profile. Walking along here before we move on to this slide, that red peak there is aggregation. You'll notice we do not see it in UV or by differential refractive index. But we do see it by light scattering. You also notice that compared to the UV and DNDC signals, the light scattering for the larger BSA components is much larger. That's again because the intensity of scattering varies as the square of the size of the particle. The bigger things in this component are scattering more strongly, even though by mass they may be the same amount or more proportional. Tech Mall's data is usually presented in this way. On one, it's a double Y plot. On one axis, you have the UV absorbance, or at least in relative terms. On the other, you have 
a uh, measurement of mass. And so plotted over the top of these gel filtration traces from UV or from differential refractive index are the, the cluster of each one second determination of the molecular mass you can plot over top. So here, for example, here's the BSA monomer, well resolved, 66 kilodaltons, right? 67 kV by C. Right? Here's hemoglobin. Here you have this poorly shaped peak, right? It's a little bit irregular. And corresponding to that, you see a mass profile that is a little bit heterogeneous. See, it starts at 62, then decays down to 52. Could be because it's missing some of the heme groups or it's degraded, but this is not as nearly a nice sample. So within a peak, even though it might have a particular retention time consistent with a particular apparent molecular mass or Stokes radius, the breadth of the peak and its shape can be an indicator of polyspersity in terms of molecular mass. So, yes. Hemoglobin undergoes. So this could be that a sampling that equilibrium there in these conditions. On the tail end of the peak, yes. Yeah. Right. Going to re-emphasize a point here. This is an experience I have with a group two intron. All right, by UV, you always see a nice single peak for this particular particle. Some of the other schmuck comes off by in the green. But we never saw unless we did sec moles the light scattering, is a massive amount of aggregation that came along with that sample that was provided to me by my collaborator. So we learned from this experiment that we had to either spin filter or size this particle before doing our scattering experiments. It's like cholesterol. You can't see it. It's there. It's killing you. Okay? So um, sizing is a very important step in preparing your sample for small angle scattering analysis. Another illustration of what's in a peak and what does it mean. If I just simply run SuperDeck 75 on this protein that's involved in a SNRP assembly, right? The apparent molecular mass is just north of the 44 kb marker. And more often than not, in the, in the early literature for this protein, it was always assumed it was a dimer based on gel filtration retention. Yes. You know, we have a little bit of discussion. There's no use. Yep. Even in small amounts, yes. small things scatter very strongly. If you get a dust particle, mm -hmm. and you, you can do this experiment, which you wanted with dynamic light scattering, rub your thumb over the cuvette before you, before and after but taking so a sample. By mass, it's a very small amount. Oh, it's very, very small amount. But it's so big that the intensity of scattering is very strong, strong. Right? If you're looking at RI UV, which is measuring mass, right? Directly measuring mass, a proportion, something that's proportional to mass, there's almost no signal. But by light scattering, which is very sensitive, you can actually see those small things even in, in minor percentages. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I can talk about that. Um, let me finish this slide here, and then I'll, I'll comment on that. That's a, that's a real thing. Um, this protein in literature for years, people thought it was a dimer because it had a retention time, nice sharp peak, uh, just north of the 44 kilodalton marker, 23 kilodalton protein. All right, but when you do sec moles on it, same exact column, same exact sample, but you actually find it's a monomer, right? And that's because if you actually look at the structure of the protein and other data, the globular domain is really long, flexible extended linker, right? So its high dynamic radius is quite large. Um, right. Here's another example. Uh, here we're characterizing the oligomer of a uh, 60 kilodalton heterodimer called Gemin 2 SMN, all right? And for many years, people thought this thing was a, some gigantic uglymer because it always ran right near the void of a column, all right? Uh, when we did sec malls on it, even though it had a retention time upwards, you know, 12 or 14 mer, we actually found it was actually sampling tetramer octamer in solution with a KD in the ballpark of a few micromoles. Right. But because if you actually look at the protein structure and what you can learn from bioinformatics of the methods, it actually looks like a bouquet of flowers. Globular domain, long linker, globular domain, but a very large spatial extent. A lot of it's unfolded. So it runs near the void of a gel filtration column. 
Okay. Um, be very careful in how you interpret SEC data, but when you use SEC in line with other shattering applications, it's quite powerful and very diagnostic. Column shedding. As I mentioned to you about buffers, you have to use filtered buffers, degas buffers. There is a pathology with GE healthcare uh, columns that use agarose type mixtures, not so much with silica resins. Um, when you run these ex those experiments on multi-angle light scattering, right, the agarose mixtures from GE Healthcare actually shed fines, right, and you have to wash them extensively, continually, to keep that amount of fines very low, so they don't create a scattering background in your data, right. I haven't seen this realized in X-ray scattering data, simply because it's always done in synchrotron, and the intensity of scattering is so much stronger at a beam line, I don't think you're going to ever realize that in the context of synchrotron measurement. But for light scattering, which is very sensitive, you will realize it if you don't wash that column very um, judiciously and continually. Right. So that, that is an important consideration. I don't believe it affects you as much with small angle X-ray scattering as the synchrotron as it would with the light scattering instrument. Yes? Uh, Used for membrane protein. Is that... the, so the question is, can you use SEC malls to study integral membrane preparations, detergent protein complexes, nanodisc membrane protein? And the answer is yes. Um, there are really, really fascinating applications of light scattering this approach, and the uh, software is to solve systems linear equations to derive the mass and stoichiometry of protein detergent complexes, protein DNA complexes, um, uh, composite systems. So you can actually leverage this technology to study com complicated things, which is pretty neat. And stoichiometry? Yes, wow. right. Because the DNDC of detergent or lipid or nanodisks is different from protein. So now you can create, you can you leverage this data as a system of linear equations right? and simultaneously solve the system of linear equations to deconvolve the protein component from the detergent component or component A from component B. And so the system I'll show you in the third talk, uh, the prototype coming by integrates, I have a white paper with uh, the folks there, Y Technologies, we did this with light scattering data I collected 10 years ago. Um, Secval say they went back and applied the method and bought on and nailed it. But it, it's, it can be applied that way and very powerful. Yes? I was just going to add my last. Yeah. And there are AEC methods now, too, that are making this more tractable as well. Okay. Any questions about SEC malls before I move on? Okay, we're doing time-wise here. Ooh, okay. So now, by analogy, multi-angle light scattering and small angle X-ray scattering aren't really that different. You're looking at the angular dependence of scattering, right? Here we're just using a different wavelength of light, right? And then leveraging all that information to get more information content out of your experiment and to also clean up the experiment. Right? So. Here's some more suggested reading. This is an area in the community that has really exploded over the last several years, right, because of innovations at the beam lines and implementing this experiment and innovations in software and leveraging all of that information. So this is a really exciting area, a frontier for small angle scattering in that regard. Here are some, uh, a number of papers that I think are really uh, useful in terms of under appreciating this developing space. All right. Um, all right. So what's the experiment here? I'm going to break it down again. Again, gel filtration, we talked about this. This part really hasn't changed except where you're doing it. All right. Let's do this experiment at the beam line. Right. And so you'll go and see the beam lines and you'll probably see this setup where a gel filtration station is set up immediately adjacent to the flow cell entering the small angle X ray scattering uh, experimental setup. Right? Most beam lines now have one, two, even three detectors allowing to capture as much Q as scattering angle as possible. And it's doing this, like the light scattering instrument with multi angle light scattering, it's doing this in one second, two second intervals. So you're collecting 
a whole ton of data across this gel, this gel filtration run. Right. You're getting a lot, of, not just one, but many, 200, 300, 400, several hundred profiles across the gel filtration run. All right. It's a lot of data because now you, not only do you have the dimension of scattering angle, but you also have the, the retention dimension as well. Okay, so you can actually correlate the intensity of scattering and the angular dependence to a position on the gel filtration profile. This is a lot of data. At first, it wasn't being fully leveraged. People were cherry picking, or people still do, cherry pick you know, the best part of the peak with the assumption that that's a pure species that's isolated away from aggregate and buffer artifacts, right? And for, for, for many things, it should work pretty well, right? But there's a much more powerful implementation and application of all of this data. Uh, and that's arrived with different applications of single value decomposition, right? And so uh, the Bernardo group out in Europe has the Cosmic software they published a couple of years ago. Um, I'm gonna focus on a version of this analysis that's implemented in the raw software you're gonna learn more about, right? It's called single value decomposition in line with evolving factor analysis, first published in this JAX paper, wonderful JAX paper in 2016. All right, where they leverage information to really isolate species of interest from the sex act experiment. And they really pioneered the application here uh, with regards to this algorithm. All right. And so you're doing single value decomposition. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this in a second. But basically, you're breaking down this large redundant data set um, and describing it along two dimensions with a minimal number of components describing the data set with maximal redundancy. And then you're combining it with an older method from the 70s called evolving factor analysis, where you can correlate the numbers of, of uh, significant species with their retention time, all right, and kind of map them out, and then break it down and deconvolute the data set into its component parts. Monomer, dimer, monomer, dimer, aggregate, tetramer, octamer, aggregate, dimer, tetramer, buffer artifact. Two or three discrete species is probably safe. If you have a continuum of things, Right, an open polymer, right, continuum of aggregates and oligomers, it may not be as robust an application, but it still could be useful. Right. Um, and so this application here all of a sudden is taken with generally a, uh, a low information approach and ex greatly increase the data to parameters, or the amount of data you're getting out of your analysis, right, the amount of information. So this is a technique uh, that's very powerful. And so if you, if you go into Steve Meisberger's paper and you see some very nice illustrations of what this data would look like on the base, most basic level. Here's the, it's not the gel filtration peak, it's actually the forward intensity, the scattering plotted, right, as a function of profile number, all right? And we can see here for each of those profiles, each of these one, these data points is a scattering profile, right? And you can use a Guinea analysis and get an RG. You can do this in an automated way now so that the software immediately calculates RG as best as it can for all these scattering profiles, and then plots them over the top of this peak feature, like you do in SecMol, giving you a readout of RG, right? You can see here, on the front end of this peak, yo, there's some aggregation there, all right? This peak isn't all that pure, really, right? Because there's stuff on the front end, leading edge, that is actually um, significantly aggregated. For reference, the RG of a ribosome is about 100. But you can see here, later in the peak, in the middle and towards the end, you must have a much more, uh, a much cleaner species. So you can collect that data and separate it from the contaminating species that might be otherwise confounding your analysis. That makes sense, hopefully, right? And then you have to get to towards the tail, tail in the pink uh, peak, where the intensity drops down. The data quality signal noise drops, and so you see wide, wider distributions of RG and larger error bars, which hopefully we make intuitive sense. The applications of this are really neat. I've now applied this, I think, four different projects, and I continue to be amazed at how well it works um, in terms of application. Studying oligomeric systems, right? If you have a system that's always a mixture of oligomers, regardless of micromolar concentration, it's very difficult, if almost impossible, to study that reliably using static SACS measurements. But in this approach, if you can deconvolute the data, you can actually pull out discrete oligomers. Multiple assembly forms, right? One project I'll tell you about today, I can actually find two different tetramers in a peak, 
different conformation that map with crystal structure. Right? Um, really neat. Right? With single value decomposition, even without the second component, you can map out temperature, ligand dependent, condition dependent um, transitions in your macromolecule. Right? And see how something changes as a response to an effector. Right? The binding of drug, the change in pH, the binding of a metal ion. All right? And take collect a series of data and then pull it together into one redundant data set and pull out the components of that data set. And then I have to mention that this is not the only piece of software in this space. Right? There's a lot of good programs that are very useful in different ways. We'll hear about some of it later on with regards to atomistic modeling. Um, and then other very uh, useful applications in terms of doing single value decomposition and fitting mixtures of profiles to the scattering data set. For now, I'm just going to focus on this one here. But there's a lot of software available now that helps you um, navigate this space. Okay. Um, so key concepts here in the application of single value decomposition is that you're trying to describe a redundant data set with the minimum number of independent components or curves. Right. And so here we're fitting, we're doing single data value decomposition analysis on a data set and testing the minimal number of components to describe that data set. What we find here is that there are three significant components. Then when you go out further, you see less significance for the additional components that are being added. So this is that SACS data set again, right? Here are the vectors along one um, domain that is I versus Q, I versus scattering angle. Here is the vectors along the I versus time domain, I, I of T, the elution profiles. And then this domain here pulls all together by providing the singular values that describe the entire data set. Okay. This paper here, uh, again, is from, is from Steve Meisberger, explains this really nicely um, in terms of how it's being applied here in the sex uh format. All right. Um, I'm not going to belabor this, but this is more illustrations of those different columns, right, in the, uh, in the algebra being performed, all right, how that, what they look like. Um, so I would suggest you know, take a look at the supplemental of that paper, and you can get a lot of good information learning about uh, the details of this analysis. All right, and then as I mentioned, uh, with evolving factor analysis, all right, so here it's, it's running the, evol the single value decomposition as a function of retention time, that is frame number, and mapping out where particular components begin and end, all right? This is very valuable in decomposing a peak into its component parts, like it could be aggregate one the front end, it could be tetra in the middle and dimer in the tail end, right? Um, this type of mapping increases the power of the single value decomposition analysis. So that application, I'm going to show you some examples of that later, but it's a very powerful analysis that helps get more information content out of your data. All right, and I'll give you a research example in a little while. Um, we had a troubleshooting thing at the beam line we mentioned before. One thing we didn't mention is that with this particular modality, size exclusion in line with SAC, all right, um, you can have certain pathologies specific to this particular experiment. And if, if either you have, anyone here has comments uh, from the beam lines here uh, to add to this, please do. So I, I've learned this, you know, I, I don't encounter it a lot, thankfully, uh, but these are real problems from project to project. The radiation damage, but as you keep dosing the protein and it crosses the capillary, you know, a, a variety of etching occurs and that aggregated protein starts sticking to the surface of the capillary. Uh, and that can start affecting the um, reproducibility and the consistency of your data, all right? And so there are different strategies that are implemented at the beam line depending on the location and the nature of the uh, radiation um, to kind of address that in addition to just cleaning the capillary or replacing the capillary, putting flow rate and glycerol to attenuate this uh, sticking phenomenon, okay? Um, along with attenuating the beam. And it's something to be aware of. It's a good thing to talk about with the beam line scientists because at some locations it may be more of an issue than others, especially with certain types of proteins. Uh, and they'll warn you about that up front more often than not. Right. Column resolution. And so understanding the properties of your column are very important. It is very possible to overload your column with material. And what happens when you overload the column beyond its capacity is that you lose resolution. Everything just comes off one gigantic schmutz of a, of a peak. 
And then that has a consequence in your ability to then collect and deconvolve that data. Because everything is just smeared together, you don't have very good resolution. Right? So it's important to understand the volume of the column and then try to limit the loading of that to one, about 1% 1 of the loading volume of that column. So you know, if I'm doing a preparative run on a 26 mil column, I probably don't load more than 500 microliters. Right? Injections at the beam line typically are lower in scale, 100 microliters, 50 microliters, especially if you're using those smaller 3 mil columns. Uh, so be, be mindful of that. And then media interactions. If you're using silica resins, they're great for light scattering, but they have no fines. They don't shed. All right, but they do have a different problem that can manifest itself in that sometimes, sometimes proteins with charged surfaces will stick to them in odd ways. Right? They, don't retain, they don't get retained and don't isocratically elute in a predictable way. Um, so sometimes you can have certain types of proteins um, stick weird in a strange way to the silica, or if you have a protein-protein complex, actually get pulled apart a bit in a way you won't see on the, a GE stock column. So being thoughtful with your media selection for your experiment is useful, especially if you're looking at macromolecular assemblies, protein DNA complexes, and things that have a lot of charge. Okay. All right. Both multi-angle light scattering and small-angle X-ray scattering have these same pathologies in the mapping of mass or RG across the peak. It's a very interesting analogy. And you can see different phenomena that cor actually correlate to specific events happening in your sample. When you have smiling like this, where you have um, the highest concentrations in the middle of the peak, right? you can have interparticle interference occurring, depressing your RG, right? and leading to this smiling phenomenon. How do you fix that? Uh, consider, you know, it's lower concentration of sample in the ejection or a higher amount of salt in your buffer. Right? Same thing for multi-angle light scattering. Frowning, the opposite. You see, you know, something looks pretty good in the middle here, but on the leading and the lagging edges, you see some strange RG phenomenon. It could be aggregation, right? Uh, it could also be some sort of attractive structure factor, aggregation of stickiness, or it could be a ligamerization of some variety, right? This is harder to figure out without doing a lot of concentration-dependent experiments. Sloping, very common, especially if your protein's oligomeric. Right? I've seen systems where you've had monomer to dimer, dimer to tetramer, dimer tetramer octamer even, okay? It is possible to sample different oligomers within a peak, even though it may have a retention time consistent with one oligomer. The way you can prove that to yourself without light scattering, x-ray scattering, is to do a series of concentrations on a gel filtration column and see how the peak shape and retention time change as a function of concentration. You should see a concentration dependence in the peak solution time and its breadth. Okay. These are real things, both in multi-angle light scattering and small-angle X-ray scattering, to be aware of. All right. This is just one research example. So now we talk about two different modalities. What's really cool is that beam lines like here at APS, you can combine these modalities together. It's almost one-stop shopping. It's kind of cool. All right. Um, you can have a situation where some of your sample is being analyzed by small-angle X-ray scattering off the beam, while another component is being analyzed by multi-angle light scattering. So it gives you a confirmation. So if you're doing something where you're deconvolving data as component parts or picking peaks in a mixture, right, you can correlate your scattering profiles with an independent determination of molecular mass. Right? So that's a very powerful application of bringing both of these modalities in line together. Right? It's also possible to do SACs in line with dynamic light scattering. Right? Um, so when you're designing your study, especially if you're looking at macromolecular assemblies and you're reconstituting things, consider doing both experiments in tandem. Right, because they need to add a lot, another dimension to your experiment um, that increases, uh, puts you in an even stronger position for interpretation. This is just one of many re research examples as uh, popping up. Okay. Any questions about this overview of SEC related applications before I move on to the shape reconstruction? We'll take time here. Uh, okay. All right. So you have these scattering profiles. And now you have the opportunity to run these algorithms. And there's a number of different algorithms that have different strengths and weaknesses and applications. What I'm going to do now is just walk through facets of this, uh, this here. And so up to this point, you've heard about the model independent analyses you can do. Guinea a plot, crack key plot, corrode divide plot, shape distribution function. All right. Those are, those are analyses you can do 
that independent of any structural model, you can learn numeric and quantitative terms, learn about your macromolecule and its properties and solutions. Now we're delving into the model-dependent analyses, right? The reconciliation of this mongol scattering data with known atomic structures and models. All right, so now, that, now we're entering a different regime, right? So usually any small angle scattering study has both of those components hand in hand. You can fit, you interpret the model independent data, and then you take it further and reconcile with the atomic structure. Right? These analyses in the model dependent way can happen with different degrees of granularity. All right. The simplest and time the oldest NL, you're simply taking the form factors for simple shapes and fitting them to the experimental scattering profiles. Here I'm fitting a cylinder with a certain length and a certain radius, and I get a decent fit to this state. Here I'm fitting a sphere. Here I'm fitting a hollow sphere. Here I'm fitting a, uh, a hockey puck all right, to a nuclear dome data. All right? And then you can do combinations of shape just as well. All right? And for many decades, this worked pretty well. All right? Then you get into the early 1990s, and uh, Harold Sir, uh, German and Dimitri Sferikun introduced uh, and made this shape reconstruction business tractable by introducing the mathematical spherical harmonics to generate or you know lower resolution envelopes of macromolecules from the small angle scattering profiles. Right. Um, spherical harmonics are the mathematics describing the surface of a sphere in different levels of a complexity. Right. And the, by applying that mathematics, you can actually start reconstructing shape in a tractable way. The next iteration, which is now remains one of the more popular uh, manifestations of this approach, is bead modeling, where you have an ensemble of beads, you juggle them around by simulated annealing, and relax them and do this iteratively until you get a match between your calculated scattering profile and your experimental data. And you get a bead ensemble against which then you can dock in a molecular model of interest. Right? Hybrid modeling takes a step towards atomistic modeling by mixing up known atomic structures and portions with beads for the missing bits. All right. Um, and so you have a hybrid of beads and atomic models that together describe the atomic inventory of the sample that was scattered that you have experimental data for. Right. Programs like Coral um, and other uh, implementations uh, I'll mention. And then more recently, Thomas Grant in um, January of last year published this very, uh, very exciting uh, new innovation in this space of direct electron density calculation um, from small angle scattering data. All right, uh, you basically solve the phase problem in a sense by using a method used in a lot of imaging reconstruction techniques. All right, um, I can't speak to it with the same expertise he can when he speaks about it, uh, but this is a technique to keep an eye on and definitely worth checking out the Nature, Nature Methods paper that was published in January 2018. And I'll come back and mention this again. But so important in all these methods is your ability to back calculate from a known atomic structure to a solution scattering profile, right? And so as mentioned in the very first talk, 1915 Dubai, right, helped us derive this relationship here where we can do that, where we can back calculate from an ensemble of atomic elements of known atomic position to their corresponding solution scattering profile. Reciprocal space scattering from a model. All right. Today, this is accomplished one of two different ways, more commonly with the Debye equation, as you see it here, or also the spherical harmonics approximation, which is also useful. Right. In X ray scattering, the scattering you get off of a macromolecule right, is not just the dry mass of the protein, but there's also a solvent boundary around the macromolecule that's represented in the data. So in all these programs that attempt to reconcile atomic models with their solution X-ray scattering, right, it's actually calculating a few different things. Calculating the dry mass and that scattering component, and additionally, additional term for the solvent boundary. Right? This is a non-trivial issue. Right? And so there are many programs that approach this challenge. Right? What happens is, our pro I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, question sure. before we get to the question of solvent. Uh, someone asks, how do I know the number of spherical harmonics from the text? Yikes. Um, there are default values. So if you read the original papers from um, Dimitri Farragut and Harold Sturman on 
application here. What happens in practice, especially in the ad SaaS programs, is that there's some default values that just tend to work well for uh, most macromolecules. 15 is the default, right? That said, you will see some people, people who kind of know what they're doing, play with that and try to optimize that parameter bit for more complex species. Um, but generally speaking, 99% of the time, defaults work really well. Yeah, typically it's highly asymmetric. Very rod-like, yes. There are many programs that have been derived in this space that try to deal with this solvent boundary issue. Because ultimately, the better you do with the solvent boundary, the hydration layer, all right, the better correlation you can achieve with your experimental data and your molecular models. Uh, the most common pieces of the software you'll see used in the literature are Cryzol, FOXS, Okay, um, but there are other variations of these programs that do very sophisticated approaches to that solvent boundary layer. Okay, um, even so far as there are now servers available that actually will do explicit calculations of solvent using multi dynamics and use that in the calculation um, and the application of the body formula. Right. Uh, so now this is from Dina Schneider at the top name. She used to be in the Solly Group, helped write the FOXS software. This review is very good with regards to talking about this issue. Um, for more, more often than not, Fox S, cries all are going to probably work pretty well for you. But be mindful that when you get to things that are, are more complex, protein DNA complexes, membrane proteins, these solvent rules fall apart really quickly. All right, for composite particles, really fall apart fast. And so the explicit model approaches work a lot better. I can tell you from experience. Yeah. Um. And why is the hydration solvent scattered differently? Ordering. Yeah, and so there's an ordered layer of a bulk solvent around the macromolecule as that contributes to scattering more strongly than the disordered solvent in the bulk. Yeah, the electrons per unit volume is different in that boundary. Protein nucleic acid complexes, it's it's downright impossible to predict <laughs> well what the hydration boundary it looks like because around nucleic acid it's very different than what it looks like around protein. And at the interface of protein nucleic acid, it's a totally entirely different story from there as well. All right. And so it's a non trivial issue that you should be very careful and mindful of if you're working with atomic models, right, and back calculating. All right. So one example I have from experience is the nucleosome. All right. Uh, for most programs, if you take nucleosome data, mononucleosomes, and try to match it to the scattering data. You get varying levels of success, because there are always a little peak feature it's impossible to get. But if you do an explicit model calculation, it usually lands right on with it with canonical models from the PDB. Um, so that's one small illustration of that. So it's something to be aware of, but more often than not, you can use one or two of these pieces of software. And that that machinery, that those algorithms fuel the applications of these shape reconstruction methods. And these shape reconstruction methods have really driven the application of model scattering in the literature, simply evidenced by the number of publications in PubMed per year for both SACs and SANS. Um, so I mentioned to you before the initial work in the 90s applying the symbol function, the spherical harmonics, the beam models. The primary method I'll mention here is Damon, and I mentioned that it's Monza or Damis as well. All right, and these are good, good citations for that. And then I'll also mention gas for here as well in this um, part of the talk. All right, so Damon, um, let me start with the next slide first and come back. This is what's going on. All right, so this is a uh, animated uh, animation from the APSAS group in Germany. And so this program runs iteratively. It takes your scattered data, the, P, the state distribution function dot out file from, from genome, right, from your analysis of your data. And it takes the data, it extrapolates the volume to that data, it creates a ensemble of spheres that correlates to that volume, and it starts doing simulated annealing, right, iteratively, trying to optimize the match between the model, the ensemble of beads, and your experimental data in an ab initio fashion. Right? There is no user input. You're not telling this pro this program anything about your protein, anything about your sample and its monodispersity. It's taking features from the primary data and fitting those with an ensemble of beats, right? 
problem with small angle X-ray scattering is that it's a very low resolution approach. So it is plausible that you can get different shapes that have the same scattering profile. Not hard to imagine when you look at scattering profiles that look like that. Okay. So in practice, what happens is people who are doing this technique will run the calculation 5, 10, 20, 30 times. Right? So you have a collection of calculated volumes. And then you'll average and filter them to get a final reconstruction. That's right. a dummy atom method. Right? This approach relies on the lowest resolution data. You're not fully leveraging the wide angle regime of the data past um, this regime here, you know, where QRG or SRG is you know, below this threshold here, all right, or Q of 0.3. The reason is, is that as you get farther out in Q, wider angles, the solvent contribution to data becomes heavier and compounds a proper estimate of the volumetric part properties of the um, particles. Okay. The program applies physical constraints to these ensembles. They have to be contiguous and connected. All right, they can't have unusual features. Uh, they're, they're, they're constrained in the calculation with a contiguous body. All right, so there's a penalty in these calculations. All right, so if they're too loose or not, you know, or overly compact or some disconnected, you know, there there are penalties applied to these calculations to make sure that they're um, giving you uh, intelligent results. Right. So I have an example here. Oh, well, one second. And so it used to be you would use Damon to do this. On your laptop, Damon would take, you know, an older laptop, perhaps 30 minutes, 40 minutes an hour. Now with Dam if it's a much more rapid implementation. You'll see it implemented in RAW, all right? And you can calculate 5, 20, 30 of these calculations uh, very rapidly. So you can arrive to a shape within a matter of 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, if you're patient, okay? Um, there are correlating programs that come along with this executable program, DAM SUP, DAM or DAM FILT. They're all used to spatially align, to propose, and then filter the reconstructions that you calculate, arrive at the final calculated volume. In doing that, it has a special, this special term called a normalized spatial discrepancy, NSD. Depending on if you're using DAMIN or gas for, the actual numbers have different meanings. Right? For DAMIN and DAMIF, what you want is that normalized spatial discrepancy. That is the uh, angstrom difference between two identical positions in two different volumes. Right? You want that to be low, ideally. For an isotropic particle, 0 0.5 in DAMIN and DAMIF implies a very good, stable solution. For something that's more anisotropic, that number may be a little bit lar larger. That's okay. All right. As you get larger, if you go over one, then you have a stability issue. Kind of like an analogy to class averages in EM. You could have an ensemble of particles of the same thing, but they all have different configurations. Disparate enough where averaging them is not honest to the um, to imply that it has a single static state. Okay? So looking at that NSD term along with the chi-square of the agreement between the theoretical and the experimental scattering is very important in assessing the quality of the reconstruction. These reconstructions can fail or not be or be poorly indicated because of flexibility and other issues like aggregation. Here's an example. And this is the, probably the worst example because I just told you protein DNA complexes are a problem, right? Because RNA, the DNA scatters more strongly than the protein. But this is still illustrated. All right. Here are 10 construct reconstructions of this protein DNA complex. It's a protein bound to a holiday junction using damage. And this is generally pretty decent data. Uh, data from a synchrotron resource allowed to 0.32 U at the time. All right. And you can see that for this particle, 10 independent reconstructions or calculations, they all have slight variability. They have some features that are conserved, like the little arm here, all right, the different amounts, the length, the maximum dimension that goes from P of R. All right. But separately, they're, you know, they look a little bit different. When you average them together, you blur those features away, you average it to the core 50% of the volume. Here I'm just rotating at 180 degrees, and you have this volume now that is a little bit more uh, regularized, right? And so in my case, I was able to calculate the dimensions of this volume and also predict the Stokes radius and the S value, which uh, I was happy because they agree with DLF, the velocity analysis, pretty well, all considered. 
this would be an example of a Damon analysis. Kind of hard to see, but I have a little lighter ensemble around the darker ensemble. So there's two maps here overlapping. One's called the Dam Aver envelope, and one's called the Dam Filt. Dam Aver is the averaging and superposition of these 10 reconstructions, the total volume. Dam Filt is the final one, that gray one, that is the core 50% of that volume, the most stable of them. Okay. Comparing those two envelopes, those two B ensembles is useful because a big discrepancy may imply that it's actually a very unstable solution. So you'll play with this when you try different tutorials. Yes? Can you choose a number of reasons? <laughs> and if you do too many, you're talking about the possibilities. Right. So the question is how many how many calculations is enough? It's a great question. I'm going to show you an example of where a case I ran out to 30, 40, and I still was getting nowhere. Um, 10 to 15 is usually par for the course, but if you're seeing sub class is a solution, some people will go out even further and then cluster the solutions and try to characterize them. Generally speaking, for something that's relatively well resolved, going beyond 20 doesn't mean anyone. Yeah, diminishing returns. Here are the gallery reconstructions I've done over the years, some published, some unpublished, all right? Uh, and they're illustrative for a couple of reasons. Um, Here's a known crystal structure doc against its Abinitio shape reconstruction. Good correlation with the crystal structure. Same thing over here. Here's a case where we have approaching DNA complexes. I have no crystal structure. Right. Here's a part. Here's a situation where I have a partial crystal structure. I don't have the plot. Right. The grab A protein. Um, there are a lot of examples where this is very useful and it can be applied. And you can see that generally speaking, this approach does pretty well at recapitulating solution shape. At least at very low resolution, right? So, it, with regard, as long as you're doing best practices all along the way, from the point of characterizing your sample all the way down to getting the best scattering data possible, you're setting yourself up where you can get a pretty decent representation um, correlating to an atomic model. There are limitations in the application of this with regards to uniqueness. Right? This is a great paper. Uh, check it out to get you. Act the uh, Journal Applied Crystallography from the Ferris Bergen Group. They really kind of took it to the extreme, tried to figure out what types of shapes this algorithm can, can and cannot capture well. Right. And generally speaking, it does a great job with most of these situations, except one particular case where you're trying to recapitulate these donuts. So donuts, for example, are, can be a struggle with this approach. Not always, but they can be. Right. So there are some shapes in the different shapes they characterize where this reconstruction approach actually fell short of um, representing the actual uh, form factor. All right, so that's a great uh, paper to read if you're interested in this approach. GAS4 is a different implementation. So again, you're taking your output from genome, you're entering into the program, but here now you're giving the program some information and you're leveraging more of the scattering data. Here, you have some a priori knowledge of what your particle is in terms of composition. You'll give the program a number of beads, dummy residues that are held together in a string of pearls, so they have implied connectivity, right? Um, and it does the same approach again, except now it's going to leverage all the scattering angle up to 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is roughly where the implicit solvent boundary model falls apart. Right? So usually for this approach, up to 0.5 is most useful. But you can go out further if you want to test it and see. Uh, people have done that, right? So here's a case example. Uh, Renee Carrington was a graduate student um, in our group, and she was studying an oligomerization domain for a protein called SMN. And in trying to crystallize it, she ended up fusing it to MBP, right, to make it soluble, because it was hardly insoluble otherwise. And she can get different truncations of the YG box, its domain, um, to crystallize if they were dimeric. Right? And we had a question, well, you know, she has a crystal structure of a dimer, what might the tetramer look like? So we took one of her best tetrameric constructs with the MVP bound. And just along with three scattering experiment, here's the density profile, here is the shape distribution function, here's how RG and mass vary the function of, this is a static measurement, it's not sex sac, right? So we did a whole slew of concentrations up towards the 10 mg per mil, so very good consistency, an I0 mass and RG, right? And we can run the gas for algorithm in a very similar way. 
in gas score, you'll find is that the NSD figures are going to be much higher. Right? If you get over two, be nervous. Right? But generally, you want the, here you want figures below two. And here it calculates speeds not only for the protein for the macromolecule, but also the solvent. And so you end up pulling that solvent beads away before you do the averaging and filtering. So here we've reconstructed the shape, we've docked in two of her dimer structures, and we see a pretty good correlation. And so here's a way we were just start testing, understanding how alicomerization might work. All right. And so gas pour is an extension of what you might see in Damon, except you're using more of the data, you're getting finer surface to volume features, you're leveraging more of the resolution of the data. And you're putting in some user inputs. So longer calculation. So have some beefy computers sitting around. Or use a web server. All right. Here's a Den's um, calculation again. Here, Thomas Grant is showing a comparison of these electron density calculations compared with ones he's published before for shape reconstructions in a structural genomics project that they published in 2011 with uh, Eddie Snell. All right. You can see that the electron density calculations do a pretty good job recapitulating what you would see from the bead shape reconstructions. Right. This is a technique worth uh, checking out, it is implemented in RAW. Another bead application is a program called Monsa, right? It's an extension of the DAMIF algorithm. But here, instead of fitting one experimental profile and deriving an ensemble of beads, you have a mixture of different beads, right, that are being simultaneously fit to multiple scattering profiles. So here's this application I'll come back to again later when I talk about some research. Uh, here I'm simultaneously fitting five neutron scattering profiles and one X-ray scattering profile to a protein DNA complex data set to derive what is a uh, protein DNA complex from a retroviral intensome, which I'll talk more about later. So the benefit of doing it this way, there's a major assumption is that the components don't change shape in isolation, don't change shape when they're bound to their partners, right? Here, I'm not incorporating scattering profiles for independent components, but this is the same species in different levels of contrast. I'm changing a different part of the experiment, not within the scope of this workshop, but here I'm changing contrast, not composition, to, to apply this method, right? The other way you can use Monza is, sorry, I guess, is to take the scattering profile of A, Take the scattering profile of component B, scattering profile of component AB, the complex. And with the gross assumption that they don't change shape when they come together and, and bind, you can simultaneously solve them using Monza to derive a two phase or multi phase bead envelope, triangulating certain components within a larger complex assembly. So here I'm correlating this estrogen, uh, estrogen receptor ligand binding domain with an intrinsically disordered protein that binds to it that we have no structure to, right? Um, and looking about how one interacts with the other in a one, one to two stoichiometry, right? And again, doing some reality checks against experimental data to make sure that the shape reconstructions make some sense, to have one foot in reality, right? This might be a more common application if you're looking at X-ray scattering profiles of two multiple components and then the components coming together. Okay, time-wise went over a bit. So, um, any questions on shape reconstruction in its various forms? Yes. How, how do we run the? How do you validate the shape reconstruction? Right. So it comes in different levels. Uh, First, the calculation itself should give you a chi-square. That is a superposition of the experimental profile with the calculated profile from the bead ensemble. That chi-square should be good. You shouldn't see a lot of irregularities in that calculation. That's the first level. Second level of validation is to take those multiple calculations and look at the NSD figures. Do they make sense? Right? You can also estimate molecular mass from the volume of those reconstructions, assuming they are compact macromolecules, because the volume should then correlate with mass. If they are flexible, intrinsically disordered, 
that falls apart very quickly. The volumes are then exaggerated in those reconstructions. They probably shouldn't be reconstructing. You, you definitely should. That's very important. That you shouldn't even be using shape reconstructions if something is flexible and turns out to This is meant for more compact species that are more discrete in solution. Yeah. This one? How much now, for example? Yeah. And both in, in the equipment. For what? Well, yeah, so how? Well, well, why is there nothing there? Yeah, or why? Because there is inventory in the sample that was scattered that is not accounted for by a structural model. So in Thomas's case here, he was being honest. He was taking PDB files from a structural genomics distortion database, including models that are incomplete, missing linkers, missing thermi, and documents. Yeah. And so this paper is a lot of fun because what Thomas was doing here was quite literally, they had these blocks of proteins they purified in, in mass production. They pull them out of the robot, they do a crystallization experiment, they solve structures, then they put the block in the freezer. And then they say, hey, what would we do that same block and then use SACs and all of those proteins? And then see how they correlate with the structural results. So in many of these cases here, these structures are incomplete because they're missing bits and pieces of the atomic inventory. But SACs does show you where that missing inventory is. So we have a remote question. Yeah. Is would you recommend using multiple algorithms such as Diamond, Gaspar, or Dense to compare the results? If so, how should one decide which one is more realistic? I would say you should do all of it. A. All right. So whenever I do Gaspar, I always check it with the Diamond reconstruction. I also check it with reconstructions that have no symmetry restraints. Right. So you can symmetry restrain these reconstructions P1, P2, XYZ, but you should only apply symmetry restraints if it's indicated by an improvement in the quality of the reconstructions, chi-square, NSDs, and so forth. Um, and then you have other a priori knowledge to rationalize that application. Say you have a hexmer, right? Do you use P6 or do you use P1? Is it an asymmetric hexmer or symmetric one? Uh, always check the non-constrained reconstruction against the symmetry restrained one. Um, check Damon versus the gas bore. Uh, because gas bore, you're entering information and biasing the calculation. In some way, all right. Dens. Additionally, I think Thomas is working on implementation of Dens at U symmetry down the line. Uh, he, has one he has one available now. Okay. Uh, you should always check the symmetry and non-symmetry restrained solutions against each other and against other types of calculations to get a pulse on what is a reasonable interpretation of the data. But ultimately, if you can reconcile it directly with an atomic structure, that would end up being the best way to go. I think the comment that I would add to that is generally speaking, to run gas for requires really good high quality high speed data. And most data sets, in my experience, don't achieve good enough high Q data that make use of gas for. So I, I would proceed with caution. The other thing I would say, which I think has probably been brought up, but it's just emphasized that reconstructions like Kushal was talking about are, are very interesting and can be very powerful, but SACS is best at model fitting and hypothesis discrimination. So you're always going to do better by comparing against your data than by reconstructing from your data. Um, so if you're not sure if the reconstruction you're getting is real, try fitting your high resolution structure against the data instead. That'd be a better approach. SACS is very good at telling you what something isn't, not necessarily what it is. There's always another model you may not have considered that could fit better. Yes. Of that. So it's always nice to see extra density compared to dog structure. That's not um, Especially if the structure has missing amino acids. But what about the inward structure of the structure of the structure sticking on? You might, you might have a problem. This is where checking all along the way. Does my mass add up? Is it homogeneous? Is the scattering data I have for really a monomer? All the model independent analyses before you get to that point help defend you against that situation. 
right? Sample validation. Um, because when you have that situation, you know, what happens? Does it get proteolized? Does it degrade when it got shipped to the beam line? You know, all these questions pop up and the questions, and then you have a lot of question marks that make it very difficult to move forward. So sample validation from minute one, right? Strategy, so important, preventing outcomes like that. 